Welcome to 10 Ideas, 50 Years. Uh, I'm Jeff Quick, and I'm trying to get in these 10 videos, 10 ideas that across that I think that you should know. Uh, today, this is the seventh video of the series, and we're going to go into a paper from the uh, Journal of Mathematical Economics in 1974, uh, Subjectivity and Correlation by one Robert Ahman. Uh, Robert Ahman should be familiar to you by now. Uh, it's kind of a um, regular feature of this series. And uh, so we're uh, going to, I guess, get into uh, not necessarily the, the proofs uh, and the you know, rigorous background of game theory, uh, but we're just trying to get across the idea of, uh, I guess, these 10 ideas so that if they come up in regular conversation, you'll at least have heard of them before, uh, or, or perhaps you know, you'll be able to you know, use some of the ideas, even if you don't necessarily understand them fully. And of course, if you want to learn more about them, you can you know, use the Google and uh, get a whole bunch more information, including reading the original paper, which in this case is a little uh, heavy, but good reading. Um, unlike previous videos, this video is going to draw a lot on previous videos. Uh, so if you have not seen the first six videos of this series, you should probably stop now go watch them because they're starting to become they're, they're, they're starting to build on each other and you're not necessarily going to get the same value out of this if you don't have the concepts from the previous video kind of down pat. And so you know stop the video now, come back later after you've seen those videos and hopefully uh, it will be much more valuable to you. Uh, the I guess third thing of note uh, is that this is uh, going to be kind of mind blowing. So, you know, take a hit from the bong and let's start. So, the idea here is, you know, as kind of in the title, we've got two things going on. One is subjectivity or a subjective probability, which uh, again, uh, as described in, I think it was video number four, um, subjective probability wasn't new. Uh, they'd known about it for a while. There was a couple of new applications for it, um, but it was something that had been around for a little while and they knew the, the people in game theory, or involved in game theory, kind of knew about it and uh, had a, an idea of how useful it was and correlation uh, and specifically the, the, the using uh, of uh, chance to determine games or to determine strategies uh, as in the first video as well as commitment and commitment to strategies as in the previous two videos. Uh, the, both of these uh, had been uh, especially by 1974, uh, kind of well flushed out. Uh, but it wasn't until this paper that the two were really combined. And so you had, you know, the question come up, well, what does it mean to game theory and to all, all this, you know, choosing of, of strategies and uh, all, all, of, all, all of this, you know, view of, of solving games of incomplete information. How, how does subjective probability affect all this stuff? And it turns out that it actually affects it quite a, a, quite a bit. Uh, and there's a couple of uh, almost shocking uh, outcomes from applying subjective probability to it. Um, and it generally ranges in two, I guess, sets of situations. First, uh, I guess, place where you start seeing things acting differently is in two-player zero-sum games. Um, two-player zero-sum games, uh, up until this point, were viewed uh, as a kind of strictly competitive. Uh, you, you know, you play as in the last video, you know, by your you know, minimax or profit-maximizing uh, Nash equilibrium function. You, you kind of live on the edge of that Nash equilibrium. You screw over your opponent. Uh, the value of the game is, uh, at, at best, uh, usually looking at about zero. You know, you're 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 at this point where, you know, it, it doesn't look like you're going to do much better for these two-player games. 
Uh, however, in this case, uh, we're going to show you how to do better and how to cooperate even in these kinds of situations. Um, and more importantly than the two players, uh, because even in, in, in the event that you're cooperating, usually, you know, the, the, there's a lot of contexts where you're still either winning or losing, you know, competing, you know, surviving or not surviving, etc. You know, that, that in itself that you can do a little bit better at the margins and, you know, expand what you can do in two-player games is not nearly as important as what you can do with three-player games and more, uh, any, anything more than two. Uh, and it turns out that you can coordinate strategies and information sharing in these kinds of games uh, so that you can both reach uh, outcomes that are beyond the potential equilibrium uh, up until this point, uh, as well as reach some of these points in a reliable way and kind of design uh, the way that you're playing so that you're kind of in a uh, higher level chance game so that you can do better. Uh, and just a reminder, uh, if from video one, uh, if you're uh, choosing a, uh, I guess, random strategy, or when choosing a random strategy, you're not necessarily choosing a strategy from a distribution of strategies. You're choosing a variable that represents uh, something in your strategy space. So, you know, just just as a you know kind of quick quick diagram, you know, you're not choosing your strategies directly. You're, you're, you're choosing your, your, your random variable to determine things in your game, but what you're choosing is not necessarily your strategy. Okay, so you know we, we've got some you know great words. Uh, we, we, we've got some you know really remarkable stuff that should be happening. How exactly does this work? You know what what is the mechanism that we can reach these better potential outcomes? And for that, we're going to start with an example game. Where we have player one and player two. Uh, and so, so what, what, what do we need to define this situation? The first is, of course, the outcomes of the game. You know, that, that's nothing new by 1974. You know, game theory has been defining these kind of games for a while. Okay, that, that's totally reasonable, something that they've been doing for a while, too. A fair coin. So, like the chance games in previous videos, you're going to have players flipping coins, determining things based on those flips of coins. You're, you're going to have chance games. Now, the thing that's new here, and the thing that, that is, as of this point, uh, kind of unlooked at, uh, is the third thing that you need, which is an event we're going to call it D, uh, that the players disagree on. Uh, and it could be uh, something, or it should be something uh, that the players have some probability or some subjective probability of. So, for example, this could be the price of Bitcoin. Uh, is it going to go up or is it going to go down? And some people are going to think that it's going to go up, some people are going to think it's going to go down, and you know, a lot of people are going to kind of fall in between. And our players 1 and 2 are going to be in the set of people who fall in between, uh, and specifically you're going to have player 1 think that the price is going to go up uh, by a, a, to a degree of two-thirds. And player two thinks that it could go up only at a probability of one third. You know, the other two al al alternatives going down or staying the same will kind of be included in the other third for player one and the other two thirds for player two. We don't really care what those are as long as we have some event that can be uh, observed by both of them in the, the context of this game, uh, or, or at least in the time frame of this game, and that these two can agree on a set of strategies to be played upon receiving information of that uh, event. And so these two players are going to come up with a pair of strategies. But before we get into those strategies, we're going to look at 
how those players would have fared without this bee happening to them. Uh, let's see, we have the first uh, player has about a 50% chance of choosing uh, one or negative one. So the you know, net value of choosing either one is going to be zero. Uh, likewise, uh, on that side, you've got about a 50% chance uh, on this side of getting a, a negative one and a 50% chance of getting a one. So each row's value is, neg or is basically zero. You have 50% chance of each uh, row being chosen by player two uh, as his move. So you basically have 50% of zero is zero, 50% of zero is zero. You're, 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 no matter what you do, your, your value of your move is basically zero. You, you can't really do anything with that. This game is set up so that you basically can't do anything with it. You're, you're screwed from the onset. There is no value in almost even playing this game. So why would you even approach it? Well, now going back to this event B, you know, the, the price of Bitcoin, the, you know, the, the, the flip of a, a, not necessarily a fair coin, but something that you, you don't know the odds of, but you have a disagreement of the odds. And what's going to happen is uh, we're going to, the two strategies are going to be uh, that player So the, the two players agree that uh, the player one is going to have uh, the top row if D happens, and if D does not happen, he's going to play the bottom row. And likewise, player two is going to play left. And the value of this is to constrain what happens in this game. So that from player one's perspective, remember, uh, you have two thirds of a chance of having one as your outcome, and one third of a chance of negative one. So you have two thirds times one is two thirds, plus one third times negative one is negative one third. So the net result of this game suddenly changes to two thirds plus one third is one third. And similarly for player two, you have a value of one two thirds of the time and a negative one one third of the time. So you get a value of one third. What happened here? We, we had a game where uh, for both players, the value of the game uh, not necessarily who wins, but the, the value of each alternative uh, outcome started at zero, and now it's at one third for both players. So if this was the utility of playing the game, we've now changed this game from a zero-sum, zero-value game to a zero-sum, somewhat valuable game, whatever these uh, outcome utility values are measured in. If this was a business deal, we would have changed it from something you probably would not have done or would not have conducted to something that you'd want to take a look at and to see whether you know this and your opponent getting the same expected value um, leads to you know the, the right kind of flow of capital or the flow of cash. Uh, it, it at least gives you kind of an interesting choice. And so that this is the kind of thing that we're we're kind of looking at here. We we we've we've added the, the perspective of each player, the subjective uh, I, I guess view of probabilities of the state of the game, and we've come up with more than we started with. The weirder part is what happens if one of the players is completely wrong. Instead of this being about 
or let, let's let's stick with this Bitcoin example. Let's say that there's a true believer who knows, quote unquote, that their their value of Bitcoin has is going to uh, increase, and there's someone else who is on the inside of some maybe some major bank and knows for a fact that his major bank is going to dump a whole bunch of Bitcoin on the market and cause a market crash. So he knows with certainty uh, that the, the value is going to decrease. You, you have your magical tux waiting with the 100,000, 200,000 Bitcoin uh, waiting to crash the market. And so you know with certainty, uh, quote unquote, uh, that each of these events are going to happen. So you, you can, even in that case, uh, you, same, same game, same situation. The payouts change from one third and one third to one times one uh, minus or plus zero times negative one, which is zero, which is one. And similarly, for player two, you have zero times negative one, which is zero, plus one times one is one. So basically, you've transformed in that case uh, the the game from a zero zero outcome game or in a game with uh, you know, almost no point of playing it to this one-one game where both players actually have, you know, the best possible outcome or the best possible uh, expectation of outcome. Uh, again, based on an external event, uh, which they are both certain of, and unfortunately one of them is logically wrong. But um, just because you are wrong does not necessarily mean that you can't act rationally on that wrong belief. And in this case, you are using your belief to at least the advantage that you are capable of. But enough on two players, because two players, again, aren't really all that interesting. You know, you're, you're, you're basically tuning the parameters of the game, you're, you're increasing the value of the game itself, but again, you're only playing with two players. What about three? So this has got a whole bunch of payoffs going on here, but the same principle applies. So we have some event where player one used the probability of the event as three over four. Player two is one over four. And player three, we actually don't care. Uh, player three knows one way or another. If B is true, uh, it's going to believe true. So in this case, we're going to assume for the moment that it's true, and that these two just don't know that yet. Uh, but if it was false, you would just walk through the example with three knowing that it's false. And normally, under this situation, uh, you have player one pretty much has to choose left, uh, otherwise there's a chance that he can get zero, uh, so he's going to always choose left, um, even if he can do right, because this one gives him a free option over here, uh, but most of the time it doesn't really make sense for him to choose right, so he's going to choose left all the time. Same thing with player two, uh, without the, he's going to look at this and go, okay, well, uh, I'm going to choose, you know, the, this, this kind of left uh, option. Uh, 
and uh, I think the player two gets to choose which of these two uh, gets picked, and then player three gets to choose uh, the top or the bottom. So player two is going to always choose this left one because the right one gives him. Uh, The left one's got this 8 here, and the, other, the right one's got two zero, so he can always get kicked down to zero, so he can always get to his left. Uh, so he's also going to be stuck here. And then player three is going to always choose bottom, because there's the chance that he can get, uh, although it's, it's more, uh, you, know, you know, choosing top is giving zeros probably all, all the time. It doesn't really make sense for him to, to choose top, so he's going to choose bottom, so that's a little bit of a safer uh, route for him. So we're going to always get, get squished this equilibrium here. Although you know, the same kind of logical argument can be uh, used to lead you to uh, this uh, choice over here. But either way, your uh, your equilibrium without using subjective probability is going to be uh, this 1-1-1 one, one, one possible outcome. Uh, now, if we have this event, which has the, the, these particular subjective probabilities, and player 1 agrees based on this, to always play top. Player 2 always agrees to play right. And then player 3 chooses the left matrix if B occurs, and the right matrix if uh, uh, B does not occur. So in this case, uh, it's going to choose this one. Which isn't all that great of an outcome. Except I think I typed it in wrong. That should be three. Yeah, should have been two. Okay, so yeah, so you're basically forcing the you know three is going to kind of guide us uh, because three knows, and so it's going to be. By playing left or right, it's going to be un, un, or revealing uh, whether the two players one and two. And because players one and two are playing top and right, they're they're basically agreeing to 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 get to the point where the, this this all three outcome is possible. And so the the higher payoff happens in the event where where D is true, and in the event of where D is false. So in this case, uh, the higher payoff doesn't even matter whether D happens or not, although that's not always going to be the case. Uh, two, uh, if uh, player three um, or player three can't actually improve uh, based on whether or not D is the case. And uh, three, players wanted to actually could increase their take uh, if they knew about B. I.e., player two could go there if it knew uh, one way or the other, and player one could go over there. So player two is going to always want to go uh, left instead of right, and player one's going to want to go down instead of up. And so there, there are these kind of defection uh, contingencies on whether B. But because one and two, or players one and two, don't know whether B, that these two contingencies are kind of kept at bay, and player three is able to force player one and two to basically act within the, a greater equilibrium than would normally be possible by use of this game. And so, uh, the, the, the paper itself goes into a good, you know, number of these examples. I'm not going to go through all of them. But this is just kind of two examples, one for player two, or one for two players and one for three players, showing that there's this kind of external world enabling factor that you can get into. And that it doesn't even require that all players cooperate and all players play this particular chance game, or all players even view the same event. Uh, some players utilizing this will actually increase the value of the game to all players. Uh, 
uh, or at least all the players that they choose to to uh, cooperate with. And so, again, players 1 and 2 don't even have the incentive to try to find out whether D is the case, because they know that if the information of whether D is the case uh, falls into the wrong hands, player 3 is going to defect, and their other players are going to defect as well. So they have to basically at least be seen to not know whether D the, whether the. Uh, now there is, there is a I guess a requirement that the probabilities, especially in two player games, uh, have a particular quality, which is that the first probability, or player 1, uh, has to be greater than 50%, and the second probability has to be less than 50%. And in particular, they cannot agree. Um, if they do agree, you need to find something that they do not agree on. Thankfully, the universe is set up in such a way that finding things that people disagree on is usually not too difficult. Um, you can you know, get into an Emacs versus VI war at the drop of a pin, it should not be too difficult to find something that two particular individuals who are already in a conflict or potential conflict situation do not agree on, that is not related to the game itself. Not related and independent from the game itself is critical. Um, so, uh, of course, if player one and player two is, uh, you know, swapped where you have, you know, one is higher and one is lower and it doesn't work out that way, just flip it around until you get to this point where you have two players with one over 50%, one less than 50%. And it turns out that you can always do this. And they don't actually describe in the paper how you can always do this, but with a little bit of a, extra thinking, you can come up with an algorithm to do it. And uh, this is, an, I guess, implementation of one. Uh, you have a defining function that gives you uh, basically an exponential of 2 to the power of something minus 1 over 2 to the power of something. That's going to look like this, uh, where you have basically a, a um, in binary it's going to look like a whole bunch of 1s divided by a whole bunch of zeros, And the net effect of that is going to force the two probabilities you have apart. Uh, and it's going to have done this uh, using this other function, where first of all we're going to get the difference between the two probabilities, which is still a probability, uh, I might add. And because it's still a probability, I'll take the absolute value, just to keep things uh, safe, and still a probability, uh, probabilities have entropy. And so if you take the entropy of the probability, divide one by that, you get the number of basically bits uh, or something close to the number of bits or the number of coin flips you need to, to simulate it. And uh, using this, you'll, you'll, I guess, just balance out or should balance out the number of coin flips required um, or, or at least give you the probability representing the, the coin flips that would be required to um, to come up with two uh, for for any given two probabilities that are both greater than or less than uh, fifty percent to basically force them apart. Um, uh, this may not work. This is just kind of what I've thrown together to, to work, uh, but it, it does seem to work. And so, just to, to give an example of how this would work in practice, going back to our examples in, in the one situation where you have you know one person who's very sure. Uh, you know, if their god has told them that B, uh, and another person has a different god that has told them something else about B, uh, so the two have uh, two separate probabilities, one is 100%, one is 0%, uh, you'll have, I mean, you don't even have to put it into this algorithm because already you have, um, you know, one over 50%, one less than 50%, you can use it as is, but if you wanted to just take a look at it to see what it looked like, you'd have a very high difference. 
because of the, the probability is very far from 50%, you have a, I guess, very, a very high entropy. And so very, very uh, low number of coin flips that it would determine. So inverse of a very high number means a very low number. And so you would end up with uh, two to you know, some low number uh, which would determine you know, something close to you know, half, which is basically one coin flip. And so the, 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 the goal and the idea here is that your, for, for probabilities that are very far apart, where there's a lot of disagreement, where you have you know, religious arguments, where people are, are disagreeing and cannot see you know, how things could be the other way, you, you only need you know, minimal coin flip, maybe even zero coin flips. Uh, whereas for probabilities that are very close to each other, so like the 50 to 51%, the 50 to 50.00001%, you know, you'll end up having a very high, or very low entropy in that, which will turn out the, the inverse of the low entropy, the high number of uh, bits required to, to encode it, and, uh, or, or at least to simulate it, and uh, th this will give you a much higher number. Uh, a probability that you basically have to add to the situation to uh, to, uh, to to spread your your two uh, subjective probabilities of the event apart enough of that one of them is below fifty percent, one of them is above fifty percent. So. So th this is basically showing us that for for players of or for games with three or more players, you have you know that this kind of agreement on strategies before the game starts uh, enables you enables all players potentially to be better. Uh, and it's it's a quite general finding. It's it's also something that, that is going to uh, I guess fa facilitate. Or, 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 or it's going to require uh, the ability to commit. So from the previous two videos, the discussions about you know being able to commit, being able to communicate, uh, become uh, critically important. Uh, but the the goal is to be able to uh, always get to this uh, better outcome. And this can be viewed as the difference between uh, cooperation and non-cooperation in terms of if you have the ability to commit and the ability to cooperate, this use of external events will expand the, uh, the possible outcomes so such that you will be able to reach better outcomes. For if you are viewing this outcome enabling tool in the event, or, or in the context of non-cooperation, so you're still trying to play greedily, uh, this will still be beneficial to you because it is going to be allow you to reach uh, outcomes and to increase the value of the game itself. So it's, it's in increasing the feasible uh, outcomes you can reach even as a selfish player, even without commitment, even in the event where you are you know, still playing against your player rather than necessarily with them. Uh, and as pointed out, uh, this also applies where players are utterly wrong. You know, if, if one player has a god that says something, and another player has a different god that says something completely different, this still applies. You can then use their interpretations of probability to govern behavior in a way that is beneficial to all parties involved, at least according to their understanding of the world. Uh, specifically, uh, it allows you to change the utility of a zero-sum game uh, such that your utility is increased from uh, typically equi equilibrium points have utilities of V for the value of the game for the victor and minus V for the value of the game for the loser uh, and almost without exception this is going to be the value of your equilibrium points however uh, 
there are going to be points that you can reach with this kind of strategy that are greater than B and greater than negative B for both victor and loser. And so I'm um, not going to go into the proof as for why this is, but this just gives you sort of, it, it, it breaks uh, the view of equilibrium points as this particular couple of, of values. So that, that's kind of the, the description of what they've accomplished. Uh, but some implications are, are going to follow from it. First of all uh, is the, the view of gambling and the view of, of basically staking your, your, your dependent uh, I, I guess outcome on things that is going to very closely resemble gambling. Economics up until the 60s and 70s had talked about gambling and had talked about you know, your, your utility of view of money uh, and its ability to you know, justify, at least in some situations, taking risks or taking bounded, uh, I guess, views of you know what risks are appropriate uh, and that some risks are appropriate, depending again on the, the value of money. Uh, but this is going to be a new way of looking at risky behavior and, in particular, gambles. Uh, and that uh, this is actually going to be a value or a positive thing that gambling will allow in that you're basically using it for socially beneficial purposes, or at least, uh, if not socially beneficial, then personally beneficial purposes. This is not just, you know, throwing a ball on a roulette wheel. This is throwing a ball on a roulette wheel and then using the information that it gives us. It is using the randomness that these otherwise, you know, socially useless outcomes would have provided for us, for something useful and for governing behavior and governing action and governing thinking. Uh, so, the you know some some example uh, consequences of this are going to be that you know this is going to be some of the basis of why decision markets work and stuff like the foresight exchange and stuff stuff like Robert or uh, Robin Hanson and his writings is going to be justified in, to a large degree based on uh, reasoning such as this. Uh, two, uh, there's going to be uh, again two ways of looking at the results. Um, that you're going to be able to both expand your, your possible outcomes and your, uh, if, if you're cooperating and um, expand the, or expand the, the, the value of the outcomes if you cooperate. If you don't cooperate, you're still expanding the possibilities. Uh, three, your, the, it, it highlights the fact that even in the event where uh, contracts are impossible, the the idea of commitment still holds because even if you can't get all the players in a game to agree and to stick by their agreement and to abide and to commit, to the extent that you and any of your other players are able to commit, you'll probably be able to use this to your advantage. Um, your you know, uh, an another point uh, worthy of mention is going back to uh, uh, I believe video number three or four uh, with the uh, I games versus C games and games of complete versus incomplete information, uh, this is still going to apply. And so you're going to be able to do better on games of incomplete information. All of this specifically re relates to complete information. But again, you, you use the same strategy as one in one game, create the, the, the complete game in front of the C game to represent your I game, use the strategy from one on the other, and so on. It avoids the complications we ran into uh, relating to commitment. Uh, it is kind of above and beyond that. So it, again, if you have commitment, you can do better. If you don't have commitment, you can still do better. Maybe not as good as if you could commit, but that's life. Um, so another point uh, is by 1974, all these examples were in matrix form. They had not as of yet looked into whether it was possible to encode this into uh, extended form or to kind of bring this to a higher level and cook it right into the games themselves. You can bet that that was what they were going to research shortly thereafter and fruitful things would have come from that. Uh, another point, uh, the, uh, especially in the view of a zero-sum game, uh, you start really quickly looking at things in terms of utility. Again, so this, this is the utility function is going to uh, 
to, to allow us to, to you know to, to to measure whether or not this this is more valuable or not. Uh, and so very quickly from you know playing a zero sum game or even not, you're going to start thinking in terms of utility. And from from there, you're going to start thinking of terms of, mo of money, as as we've discussed in the, one of the previous videos. Uh, and from there, and you know th this is something that they would have probably gotten into in economics by about this time. Uh, but the value of money itself, uh, there, there's there's utility and value of use of money and what you're planning on using that money for, and whether money is valuable at all to even want. Uh, and then from there, it's a very short step to the question of greater human values themselves. And this is actually explicitly brought up in the paper as something worthy of consideration. So so again, we've, we've gone from these you know very small, almost trivial, uh, simplified games of perfect information, and we've expanded to games of incomplete information, touching the entirety of human values. Um, and the, the, these questions start becoming very big, uh, very complex. Uh, if you start looking at the, the, the ways that Harsanya was looking, even for games of two or three players, you end up splitting those players into mi potentially millions of sub-players, having to simulate all their probability distributions. The, by about this time, they, they were recognizing that no matter how much computing power you threw at this problem, you're probably going to have trouble with it. And so you need some way of breaking this problem apart and making it a small world problem. Uh, and this allows you to do that because it gives you subjective probabilities uh, with which to, to kind of benchmark what you can come up with from. So the, you, the, 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 the type of player you are becomes, I guess, encoded within the game potentially as a subjective probability. They didn't really go into the math about this at all. Uh, but again, this is something where uh, it is very likely that this is going to kind of separate out specific components of any given problem, so it's not all coupled together. So the, the solving of general human problem or human value problems uh, does not necessarily have to happen before you can solve a zero sum game, and vice versa. Uh, but at the same time, uh, insight gleaned in one can certainly be used in the other because as your certainty increases in one, you can kind of percolate up. That, that certainty to work on the other. Uh, now there is something kind of worthy of mention here as well, uh, that kind of a caution, a note of caution. Uh, the implication of this is that you, or the, the question of, would you be willing to bet your entire career on an event that you know nothing about, uh, or at least that you know very little about? And so for example, the price of, again, of Bitcoin, you know, would you be willing to bet your entire career or life on it? Um, this may be something that causes you to, to feel very unsettled. Uh, however, uh, e even going back to von Neumann and kind of classical game theory, uh, this is no different in principle than flipping a coin. And if you would be willing to flip a coin with the odds uh, in question and to come up with the I guess outcomes in question, you should still be willing to do the same on an event you know nothing about. Your knowledge uh, does not necessarily give, uh, govern uh, outcome unless you give it away to do so as we're kind of doing. And so uh, you shouldn't be worried about that uh, because you're using it in a kind of a, a productive way. You're, you're using your ignorance to your advantage in, in a sense. Um, the the other kind of uh, point worth pointing out is that uh, this is going to make zero-sum games about more than just the outcomes you get. And you're going to have to uh, bring it up to the level of discussing the utilities of playing the game, utili utilities of the, the various outcomes. And you're, you're going to very quickly learn things about your other players. And the question of what to do at that point becomes less a matter of the outcomes of a specific game, uh, but how the game itself is interpreted. I'm not going to go too far into that, but just as a, as a kind of a point. And the last thing to bring up uh, is the, uh, at the, at the time the paper was written, uh, it was pointed out that each player is, has incentives to not do anything otherwise but you still have to abide by the, the construction of this event. And this event was viewed in the paper in terms of 
a you know roulette wheel that is constructed mutually to the satisfaction of each player. And each player would satisfaction or satisfactorily uh, create this roulette wheel, this potentially electronic roulette wheel, because it was in their interest to get to the point where they could play this game where they're cooperating, uh, and where it is not in their interest to defect from that. Uh, because in each of these cases they can do better and can do worse by not doing so. And the, 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 the problem of creating this quote-unquote electronic roulette wheel uh, was seen as you know, a technical problem, not a very serious one in practice. Uh, of course, you know, 40 odd or 50 odd years later, we have electronic uh, roulette wheels almost on our watch. Uh, we have them in our pockets, in our cell phones. Uh, the supercomputers are basically live on our bodies, and that we can, you know, with a couple of lines of code, we can hopefully get uh, enough uh, randomness uh, in a publicly shareable way without too much trouble at all. Uh, so that that I guess worry of players not being willing to, you know, come up with this randomness. Uh, hopefully should be a lot less of a worry in 2014 or 2013 than it would have been in 1974. So, in summary, use your external events and your disagreements for your advantage and for the advantage of people who may not even know that the, they're gaining an advantage from it. Um, you're going to do better in zero-sum two-player games and, more importantly, in multiple-player games. Uh, we use functions like this to come up with uh, probabilities that are split higher and less than 50% uh, in order to split your games apart so that the math balance is out. And uh, I guess happy problem solving. Uh, tune in next video when we uh, talk about, um, I think that we're, we're going to be talking about nursing. Uh, and uh, so again, this is that. Uh, and ideas 50 years. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, or if you want to see another uh, example game, or two, or three, or ten, um, you know, feel free to uh, drop them as comments into wherever this video is posted. Uh, you know, hopefully, I've gotten enough of the details right. Uh, but uh, again, I'm I'm learning this stuff as well as you, so uh, you know, hopefully we're, we're learning together, so if, if there are any mistakes, feel free to point them out, uh, and uh, hopefully you're enjoying this, uh, but again, feel free to leave uh, feedback.